Assalamu alaikum and thank you for joining us today. My name is Abdullah Dubai and I am a proud staff member of Syracuse City School District. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Hiba Muhammad and I am a fellow teacher in our district. We have gathered insight from both current and former Syracuse City School District students that will guide our presentation today. We're excited to share with you today about one of the top religions practiced by our students, Islam. In addition to hearing from our students, we will be sharing key facts and data about Islam and Islamic practices. Islam is the second largest religion in the world after Christianity. A person who practices Islam is called a Muslim. There are approximately 1.8 billion Muslims in the world making up roughly 24% of the world's population. In the United States, there are approximately 3.4 million Muslims. In New York alone, there are between 800,000 to 1 million Muslims. The word Islam is derived from the word Salam, which means peace in Arabic. Muslims are monotheistics, which means that we worship one God, whose in Arabic is called Allah. The Quran is the holy book of Islam. The Quran is written in Arabic, though Muslims have a variety of native languages. A mosque or masjid in Arabic is the house of worship in Islam. An imam is the leader of the mosque. Islam started in Mecca, which is a city in Saudi Arabia today. Islam follows a lunar calendar, which is different from the standard calendar. A lunar calendar is based on the monthly cycles of the moon phases, which makes it vary for 11 days each year. For this reason, Islamic holidays such as Ramadan and Eid do not fall on the same date every year. Among the 1.8 billion people who practice Islam, there are a wide variety of ethnic backgrounds. It is important to remember that religious practices may differ from cultural beliefs and practices. I feel like people just assume that we all speak Arabic or that we're all Arab. And that's not really the case. Um, yeah, like we're all Muslim and we all come from like different backgrounds, we come in different colors, but we don't all, we're not all Arab, we don't all speak Arabic. The map you see here shows the percentage of Muslims by country worldwide. Some of the countries with the largest numbers of Muslims are Indonesia, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, and Nigeria. Much like the population of Muslims worldwide, the population of Muslims in Syracuse is also diverse. In Syracuse City School District, we have students from over 50 countries speaking over 70 native languages. Many of those students practice Islam. Some of the home countries of our Muslim students in Syracuse City School District are Somalia, Yemen, Afghanistan, Syria, United States, and many more. I feel like the city school district is pretty diverse. I see a lot of people who look like me. You know, it's a lot of people from different backgrounds and it's like a mix of everything. So it's not like I'm like, <clears throat> sorry, like a small group or a small percentage. I feel like there's a mix of everything. When I first came, there weren't many Muslim students there. So like, I feel like I was an outsider, so I was always alone. But then as I, as years go by, the Muslim kids started coming and started like speaking for ourselves. Muslims come from diverse backgrounds and different cultures. However, all Muslims adhere to the five pillars of Islam. These are the five most important duties that a Muslim practices. The five pillars include the Shahada, believing in one God, Allah, and Muhammad is his last messenger. Salah, praying five times a day. Zakah, donating to charity. Salm, fasting during the holy month of Ramadan. And Hajj, making a pilgrimage to Mecca at least once during their life. Uh, many 
non-believers or say uh, uh, just uh, other people in general, they believe that we are forced to do things. As Muslims, we choose to do it because uh, it's a religion of freedom. You know, we can't force someone to do something. Uh, most people believe that we are forced to fast, we are forced to pray. No, that's not the case. We as Muslims choose to pray. We choose to fast. So many, they have many misconceptions that we are like very like hard and very, we have to do this and all that stuff. No, we as Muslims choose because we believe that is what's best for us. It comes before education. It comes before our family. So as Muslims, our religion comes before even ourselves. So if we have to do something, we do it for the sake of Allah. And we don't do it for the sake of people. We do it for the sake of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God. As Hiba mentioned, the second pillar of Islam is Salah, or prayer. Prayer is central to Islamic belief. Followers of Islam believe that it is important to pray five times a day. There is a process of physical purification before the prayer, where the hands, arms, face, and other extremities are washed with water. This is known as wudu. The prayer itself consists of different physical postures alongside Quran recitation. Most important thing is prayer, your daily, five daily prayers. There's something called wudu, which is getting prepared to pray. So we wash our face, hands, and then legs, which you have to take off your shoes and socks. And like if a random person walks in that don't know nothing about Islam, they'll be like, oh, are you taking a shower? What are you doing in the bathroom? Why is your shoes off? So like. I will um, like for them to know that when we're doing that, we're doing it for a reason, and they should know that we're preparing to pray. We do that because it's like when we pray, it's like we're facing God, and then yeah, you know, like we need to be clean and respectful. The fourth pillar of Islam is fasting during the Ramadan. Ramadan is the ninth month of the Islamic calendar, observed by Muslims worldwide as a month of fasting, prayer, reflection, good deeds, and togetherness. During this month, Muslims fast from dawn to sunset each day. Fasting means refraining from drinking and eating. Most of us probably just stay up, because I stay up. I can't wake up at 3 a.m. to eat. But most of us, like we stay up till 3 a.m. so that we can eat and then pray. And then, then we have to wake up at 8 o'clock you know, so it's like we don't get much sleep either. Mm -hmm. And then throughout the day, we have to pretty much stay up because we also have to pray five times a day. And then, uh, I mean, if you had like a job or something, which most of us probably did, you know, you'd have to go to your job and then you have to focus on school. And then when you come home, finally or something, you know, you, you kind of are like too tired to really do anything. We go to school. Sometimes, some of the times I'd even go to sleep and I'd go to school yeah. tired and hungry. And like it's hard to concentrate, focus, and fast. As Muslims, we believe. I think after puberty, it's a must. They must fast. They must try. And if they're kids, like they, they're small, you know, you should uh, start teaching them as they're young. So when they get older, they're more used to it. So if they can't, uh, you know, as they growing up, they will they will learn. I look forward for it every year because I always feel like I just need to get my soul cleansed. I just need to like get back on track and like better my like. Self. So I would say that because it's it's a holy month, you know, like it's a lot of practicing of like reading the Quran, praying, you know, like giving to charity, a lot of that. At the end of Ramadan, Muslims celebrate Eid al-Fitr to mark the end of this fasting. Later in the Islamic year, Muslims celebrate Eid al-Adha to recognize the culmination of the annual pilgrimage to Mecca. My favorite, my favorite is Eid al-Fitr, the one right after Ramadan, because I feel like that one is more like, I don't know, it's been a whole year since we had a celebration, so it's gonna be more fun too. Muslims have like only these two celebration, and it feels like it means so much to me, because it's only that one day where like, no one is like going to school, no one is going to work, no one is worried about anything else. Everyone is just worried about just going to the mosque, like visiting families, eating as much as you can, trying to give um, charity, trying to give back to people, like calling people back home. During the holidays and stuff like that, 
like for an example, let's say Christmas, Christians usually they have like big family gatherings all at like maybe the grandparents' house or someone's house and they would all gather together. Um, with me and my family and our religion on Eid, we would all gather also like at a grandparent house, like the entire family. And we would open presents, we would get gifts the same way Christmas Christians would get gifts under a tree, stuff like that. But we just don't have the tree part. <laughs> you may notice that many Muslim women wear head coverings. In Islam, this is an act of showing modesty and dedication to their faith. These can vary in type and style dependent on the woman's choice and cultural values. Typically, a Muslim woman who wears a covering remains covered in public and especially around males who are not immediate family. The coverings shown here are called hijab, niqab, and shador. Religion and culture is like very separate. So like if you ever see like Yemeni women, they usually are covered with a burqa and sometimes my mom, she wears a niqab, right? She doesn't have to, but she just does it because out of like what she used to do in Yemen. But then you'd see girls that also wear skinny jeans and some girls don't wear the hijab at all and, you know, all types of stuff like that. So, like, it just depends on which kind of Muslim, where they come from. Dressing, like, the way I'm dressing is not something that we should do. It's just, like, your choice. And then, like, the most thing that we're supposed to do is cover our head and the skin, like, so our skin should not show. So, like, people always, like, you know how everybody wants to do some, whatever, whatever they want to do. So, like, if I'm dressing this way and then there's another one that's dressing different, we're all Muslim at the, at the same time. Muslim women, there's girls that wear the hijab that don't wear the hijab. And you shouldn't ask why because it's, like, their like decision if they want to wear or not. I wore the hijab at a very young age. I was in kindergarten when I, like before even I went to kindergarten, I was wearing hijab. So like at first, my first couple of years of school, like first grade, kindergarten, second grade, nobody really said nothing. It was just like I was a bit different from them, but they didn't really acknowledge it. But then like around third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, that's when most people started like saying stuff about it and it was out of ignorance because they didn't really know the importance of the hijab to me so they thought oh it would be funny oh let's go take off her hijab or oh like why do you wear that on your head and stuff like that i feel like some people like kind of assume that i was forced or like pressured to wear the hijab when that really was not the case at all um i chose to by myself like my parents did not force it upon me um, when I started high school, I started wearing my hijab, but like middle school, elementary school, I didn't. It just was a choice I wanted to do. I was like, okay, I'm going to enter a new school, new chapter of my life, and I kind of want to like start fresh. So I just went in wearing a hijab. And I feel like people were like, who went to my middle school with me when I started high school, they just assumed that like, I have this terrible family who forced me, <laughs> who like forced me into being this oppressed little girl. <laughs> That's not the case. As we heard from our students, a Muslim woman's choice to remain appropriately covered is important to her faith and can be challenging at times in a school setting. For example, a female Muslim student may be reluctant to participate in swimming if a male is present because it might go against her Islamic values and beliefs. Understanding the personal values and beliefs of Islam and the significance of attire for a Muslim woman is important for us to take into consideration as educators. Jim, we have like a unit usually, and it's like the swimming unit. And you can like pick if you wanna be in a co-ed class or like an all girls class. So usually I would be in the all girls class, but then we would have like a lifeguard who is a male so if I was, because I am allowed to like take my hijab off around other females, if I was to really like, let's say participate in the swimming unit, I'm not really comfortable with the lifeguard being a male. When kids or students get into swimming pools, they mix with um, non-mahrams, which are like people they could marry, like non-family. And um, no matter whether they are covered or not, they can wear leggings and a t-shirt, a burkini, the water is just going to stick 
the clothing onto their body. So you got to try and avoid your body being revealed to all men. A similar demonstration of modesty in the Islamic faith is the way females and males interact. Muslim women and men should not come in physical contact with the opposite gender if they are not closely related. In Islam, we believe you can't touch a man if he's like not your, if he's not your mahram. A mahram is like basically the men that you're allowed to touch, and that includes like your grandpa, your father, your father's brothers, and like your mom's brothers. Like like in Islam, like basically anyone that you could marry, you can't touch. So like even including our cousins, like we are not supposed to touch them. So as a man, like if you're like greeting a Muslim woman, I feel like you shouldn't like. You should just be like, because if you see like sometimes when a man tries to shake your hand, like most women do this, because like they're not supposed to touch. So just do anything like, oh, hey, how are you? Like don't go like right in for a hug or um, like a handshake or something. So, uh, you know, you, you have your distance and you just say assalamu alaikum or hello, it doesn't matter, any, any respectable greeting. And you just try to stay, keep your distance because, uh, uh, what's it called? We as Muslim men, we, we try not to, only our, you know, our closest family, like our mother and sisters, but like any other, we try to stay away, you know, greet them, be respectful, uh, treat them with respect. And uh, for any non-Muslim males, I, I would say to do the same. Just to say hello and like be aware of that, like um, that Muslim woman can't touch the, um, the opposite gender if it's not their father or uncle or their brother. So just like being aware and just like, like not making an awkward situation because there's sometimes they'll just like put their hand up and now you're like, oh, like should I, I don't want to embarrass this person. You just start greeting that person. So just being aware of that, just say hello and they would know that like, okay, this person understands it. In following Islamic practices, Muslims do not eat pork or food items containing pork products like gelatin. Muslims also do not consume alcohol. When eating meat, it is recommended that Muslims eat halal meat, which is meat that has been slaughtered in an Islamic way. Now, our students will share about how this has impacted them at school and tell us some typical foods they try to avoid. I remember we used to have pizza parties in elementary, but then sometimes the pizza would have pork. And the teacher, she would feel awful for getting me pork, but then I would be like, I can't, it's not like I can eat it or anything, so I just have to just suck it up. <laughs> Most things, I feel like you should you should check on the label, it'll say gelatin on it, and you should see that before you try to give it to most of the kids. It's crispies, like marshmallows in general, most gummy, gummy products, um, like jello. Marshmallows, Jolly Ranchers, uh, uh, there's other ones, uh, Pop-Tarts. Specific pop tarts. Some of them come with beef. Some of them come with just pork gelatin, uh, gummy bears, stuff like that. Usually come, have gelatin. They have all the ingredients in the back. Usually you can figure it out pretty easily. That's how we figured all this stuff out. Very simple. Just read the ingredients and like ask the student. Oh, I guess it has gelatin. Do you want me to get you something else? And like make sure you have something that's like that doesn't have it just in case. Usually like beginning of the school year, right in September, um, in history class, when we would be talking about 9-11 and everything, I would just be just sitting there and the teacher in the whole class would just look at me as soon as she would mention the words like 9-11 or like terrorist attack. And we have to respect that we have Muslim students in this class who also, you know, maybe had like family or relatives who also lost their lives that day. So like, let's respect that and not like treat her differently or look and give her like weird stares. Let the students say my country or they speak say my language to help me first a uh, couple months in school and to translate for me what I have to do. They take me every day to the class, every hour, and they do whatever I want to help me like to understand the language and to understand I ha what I have to do here. It just was amazing, I love it. Actually, he was my counselor. Uh, counselor, he was also my soccer coach. Like, he would like he would see some videos. I think he was just doing research, and then we would come to school, 
Like the kids during lunchtime, especially in Ramadan, they used to hang out in his uh, office. So like he would just ask us questions about Islam and then we would just answer to him. He was curious. Uh, during Ramadan or Eid, to give us a little more lenience and, and to give us a little bit more of a break uh, and during those times. And, uh, uh, and our obligations as to pray five times a day to, you know, give us at those times a break, like five to 10 minutes we go pray and come back to class and to not really, you know, affect the other students, but as well fulfilling our obligations. The teacher could give us like, say like it is gonna be um, next week, like if we have, if she has the, if she have the work that we're gonna do on that day, give us an earlier time so we could do it. Like later we don't, we could enjoy our day without knowing, with knowing that we don't have no work to do after going back to school, like making up work and stuff. When it's the month of Ramadan, I wish like I wasn't always the first one, the first person to say something about it. I wish the teacher came up to me and said, oh my God, it's like the first month, happy Ramadan, Mubarak, something like that. Or like, I feel like if they said that to me or like, be, like became more understanding of Ramadan, it would be helpful to me. It feels good when you're talking about your religion to people and they're actually like, you know, wanting to learn about it. I want other people to know that we aren't like a religion of war and we're not like how people like to assume that we're not free. Like this is completely free of will, you know. We do what we believe just the same way as anyone else does is what they believe. I think it's a really beautiful religion that a lot of people should probably be like be open-minded about and not just hear what the media says about us. That's not always the case. In Islam, we are very welcoming, you know, we're not gonna, you know, throw you away because you're from a different religion. In our religion, we believe, لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَلَا نَدِينَ Because you have your own religion and we have our own, we're gonna respect each other, we're gonna work with each other in, in every way, through work, school, anything like that. I'm proud to be Muslim. Shukran, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate your dedication to our students and the time you spend learning about Islam. This presentation is an effort to open the door to understanding the Islamic faith in our Muslim students. During the students' interviews, we asked the students where they would suggest we go to get more information if we were interested in learning more about Islam. Many of the students agreed. Religion is so engraved into us. I feel like you could ask any student in the school whether or not they new to America or, or just got here. Like, I've been here in America my whole life. I don't even remember my country, and I could tell you anything about Islam.